long as both sides continue to blame each other for what happened, the bitter divisions in Georgia today can only deepen. Bill Turnbull, BBC News, Tbilisi. The Soviet Union has become an associate member of the International Monetary Fund. Its membership was sealed at the Kremlin this morning when President Gorbachev exchanged letters with the head of the IMF, Michel Cambosou. Associate status entitles the Soviet Union to draw on IMF expertise to overhaul its troubled economy. But only full members of the fund qualify for loans. Here, an opinion poll in tomorrow's Independent on Sunday newspaper suggests that after their Brighton conference, Labour are now seven points ahead of the Conservatives. Another poll in today's Daily Telegraph puts them two points ahead. The new survey by NOP in the Independent on Sunday puts Labour at 46%, the Conservatives at 39 and the Liberal Democrats 13. A similar poll a fortnight ago gave Labour a lead of 3%. Neil Kinnett left Brighton reportedly delighted with Labour's conference, but his colleagues said they were confident of a boost in the polls. That confidence seems to have been justified. This rapidly increasing level of support reflects the popularity both of our leader and of the policies on which we will fight the next election, the health service, jobs and investment, policies on which the Conservative Party have got nothing left to offer the country. John Major's task in Blackpool next week is to insist that his government does have the economy under control and that the party should keep faith. Over a period, things have been moving back in our direction. I'm not particularly surprised that after the coverage they've had this week, uh, the Labour Party in uh, one or two polls are doing rather better. But I think the sensible thing to do is to look at the underlying trends. And if you're chairman of the Conservative Party doing that, uh, you're not too unhappy at the moment. But the Tories privately aren't happy that Labour's attack on the government's health reforms seem to be effective. John Major, they say, will tackle that head-on next week. Nearly 3,000 family doctors have signed an advertisement in tomorrow's papers calling on the government to halt its changes to the NHS. They say that trust hospitals and fund-holding general practices create losers as well as winners in the health service. Time of year, of course, we've, we've had an awful lot of people. Nearly one in ten practicing GPs sign the statement, which claims that equal access to care is no longer a basic principle of the health service. They talk of chronic underfunding of the NHS, which they say has led to closed wards, cancelled operations and delays in dealing with emergencies. One doctor who signed it said it was inevitable such issues would be raised around the time of party conferences. I think that the difficulties with the reforms to the National Health Service are a serious problem for the Conservative Party because um, the National Health Service really is, is so important to people. The government has promised to press ahead with its programme of changes and says the doctors should look at the positive benefits. I ask the doctors to work with the BMA and others and us, seeing how we can build on our reforms and go forward together. Because I want the GPs to cooperate. There are so many advantages in the new system. The government rejects suggestions that its changes have led to a two-tier health service and says funding of the NHS is 50% up in real terms since the Conservatives came to power. In Jerusalem, thousands of ultra-Orthodox Jews have clashed with police over a new road built near their neighbourhood. The protesters, who maintain a strict observance of the Sabbath, are against car driving on their day of rest. Mounted police charged the crowd after they blocked the highway and began throwing missiles. Ten people were arrested and four police were injured. Several protesters also needed hospital treatment. Eight people have been treated for shock after a train accident at Liverpool's Lime Street station. The train was on its way to Blackpool when passengers had to get off because of a suspected brake fault. When it returned to Lime Street, it hit the buffers and mounted the platform. The driver jumped clear as the front of the train narrowly missed station buildings. He was taken to hospital with seven other British Rail staff who were standing on the platform. An inquiry has already been started into the incident. And now for a roundup of today's sports news, we join Rob Bonnet. Leeds have closed the gap on the first division leaders, Manchester United, but to do so they had to survive a second half comeback from Sheffield United. Steve Hodge scored twice for Leeds, but his second goal for a 4-0 lead just after half-time was followed by three for Sheffield. Mel Sterland scored Leeds' other two goals. Ian Wright's fifth goal in his third game for Arsenal was part of a comeback that was successful. Later, Kevin Campbell scored the winner that turned a 2-0 deficit into a 3-2 win over Chelsea. Two goals from David Hurst helped Sheffield Wednesday to victory over Crystal Palace, and Coventry's Kevin Gallagher gave his side the points at West Ham. 
So Manchester United, who play Liverpool tomorrow, lead Leeds by three points, with Arsenal a further three behind. Chelsea dropped two places to sixth, and Palace one to eighth. Between them, Wimbledon, who beat Norwich 3-1. The best individual performance of the day came in Everton's game with Tottenham, a hat-trick for Everton's Tony Cotty. His first goal prompted an immediate reply from Spurs. Gary Lineker had received a warm welcome back at his former club, and he scored a typical equaliser to register his 12th goal in nine league games. But Everton were awarded a penalty in the 21st minute, converted by Cotty to re-establish their lead. He's not always enjoyed automatic first-team selection at Goodison Park since his £2 million transfer from West Ham, but today's performance will have re-established him as one of the country's top strikers. His hat-trick was completed on the half-hour, result Everton 3, Tottenham 1. In Scotland, Paul Mason scored one of Aberdeen's four goals as they overwhelmed St Mirren, and Tony Cascarino scored his first goal for Celtic and was then sent off in the win over Hearts. So Aberdeen and Hearts swap positions at the top of the Premier Division while the other leading places remained the same. Rangers won 4-0 at Airdrie, Hibernian beat Dunfermline 3-0. Scotland have opened their Rugby Union World Cup campaign with a convincing victory over Japan at Murrayfield. They scored seven tries in a 47 points to nine win. In England's group, Italy beat the USA by 30 points to nine. For many, the World Cup draw has given Scotland the best prospects of the four home teams. Today's convincing destruction of Japan, begun with Scott Hastings' barnstorming opening try, gave added credibility to that view. Initially, the Japanese offered spirited resistance, inspired by a drop goal from Hosokawa that may turn out to be the best of the tournament. But once Scotland's overwhelming superiority in the loose had paved the way for Stanger to score their second try, the result was never in doubt. True, there remained question marks over their defence after Hosokawa had increased his personal points tally with a neatly worked try. But overall, this was a confident and promising start from the Scots. As expected, their power told towards the end, particularly that of Gavin Hastings, whose try rounded off a fine win and gave him a personal match haul of 20 points. At Otley, England's players were able to sit back and watch their next two opponents in action. But the beer may have gone slightly flat at the impressive sight of Italy outclassing the United States. They scored four tries, the best coming after a 45-yard run from their elusive scrum half, Francescato. Goal for Nick Faldo has a two-shot lead after the third round of the German Masters in Stuttgart. Faldo is 11 under par, two shots ahead of fellow Ryder Cup players Jose Maria Olofavl, Stephen Richardson and Bernhard Langer. Finally racing, the Northern challenger Malotti won the William Hill Cambridgeshire at Newmarket. Malotti, who finished second last year, just beat high premium in a photo finish, described by Lee McKenzie. But inside the final furlong, High Premium has the lead on the far side. It's High Premium who's got it inside the final furlong, but being tackled now by Malotti. Malotti goes on into the lead now, and it's Malotti who goes on into the lead from High Premium. Malotti's just going to hold on from High Premium, I think, although it's desperately close. Malotti, High Premium in a photograph. Fake dancer runs off the third, the Nature Miracles fourth. And that's where we finish for now. Tonight's main news is on BBC One at half past nine. Tomorrow, Jonathan Dimbleby talks to party chairman Chris Patton and examines the task ahead for the Conservatives in trying to convince voters the British economy is really being transformed. Tomorrow, on the record, just after one o'clock. Hello. Last week we seemed to have had a bit of everything. Temperatures, a pleasant 19 in some parts of the south. A touch of frost too, more especially in Scotland. Lots of sunshine around. Many places have 9 to 10 hours. Leeming in North Yorkshire getting 10.1 hours. But there was a lot of rain around too. The pool was very wet in one day last week with almost 3.5 inches. Now there's been more rain around today. This is what the radar shows at the moment. Still some heavy bursts in the south and southeast and a 10% chance of a rumble of thunder. But that rain will move away and a clear night with a fr frost, a ground frost for many parts of the country. One or two showers in the north, they'll die away, and then later the night we'll see thicker cloud and perhaps some rain getting into western Scotland and northern Ireland with the winds picking up as well. There's tomorrow's weather chart. Looks again another very unsettled scene for the north. So a fairly wet day uh, eventually for all of Scotland and uh, northern Ireland, but for England and Wales, bright and quite sunny, even though the cloud, the high cloud may drift across, making the sunshine somewhat hazy. In the south, temperatures getting up to 15 or 16. In the north, 12 or 13, feeling quite cold in the strong two gale force winds. 
And then as we move into Monday, still bright in the southeast, showers in the northwest, in between a good deal of cloud and some rain. That's it from me. Tomorrow, BBC Two fuses fantasy with fact. In part one of his History of Insanity, Dr Jonathan Miller plots the course of the treatment dispensed by medical men who knew virtually nothing about it. And yet, by the middle of the 18th century, they virtually monopolised the trade in lunacy, exercising control over their charges through the supposedly irresistible effect of the subordinating gaze. And Jack Nicholson flies over the cuckoo's nest. You guys do nothing but complain about how you can't stand it in this place here, and then you haven't got the guts just to walk out. I mean, what do you think you are, crazy or something? Gregory Peck's crazy about Ingrid Bergman and tormented by a murderous guilt complex in the Hitchcock classic Spellbound. Commit yourself to BBC Two tomorrow night. In half an hour, we explore the culture explosion that has erupted in the world of the cinema. Homeboys in Hollywood investigates the new surge of African-American movie makers. First on BBC Wales on Two, we're off pop-picking from the past, where over the next few weeks we can witness everything from the famous feet of Sandy Shaw to the hips and lips of Mick Jagger, the sights and sounds of the 60s. Tonight on Sounds of the 60s, the Shadows, Joe Brown, The Beatles, Peter and Gordon, Freddie and the Dreamers, Billy J. Kramer, Jerry and the Pacemakers, and the Rolling Stones. Still spring cleaning with washing powder? <sighs> what a mess! Cut a dash, cut a dash, spring clean with flash.